you got to really take a look at these so-called failed prophecies. Um, you know, what are the details? Are they, if this will happen, if this will happen, if this other thing happens most of the time, um, will Jackson County be the site of the new Jerusalem in this generation? Absolutely. Just don't tell me what this generation is 50 years or a hundred years. Cause that's not the way the savior used that term. Mm. Um, I, I, I have not found a credible failed prophecy that does not have some sort of reasonable exp- explanation. Um, Mormonism with the Murph, where Larry Singh explores church history and the church's truth claims. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph, where Larry Singh explores the church's history and the church's truth claims. And this is part two of my interview with Brian Stutzman who is the author of the book, A Timeline of Joe Smith's Prophecies Fulfilled. And in part one, we uh, talked a little bit about Brian and some of his research, talked a little bit about the book. And we began talking about some of the prophecies of Joseph Smith in New York and in Kirtland. And we're going to talk in this part, continue on with looking at some of the prophecies in Missouri and in Nauvoo. But there is one that we missed, which I think is a really cool prophecy that happened in Kirtland about uh, stars falling from the sky falling from heaven in 40 days and i believe that this was it was written according to philo dibble when joseph was preaching in kirtland ohio that 40 days shall not pass and the stars shall fall from heaven maybe you could uh talk a little about that one and how that one was fulfilled because i thought that was a pretty miraculous fulfilled prophecy if it did happen according to how it was recorded yeah well Stephen, Stephen, it's it's good to be with you on this part two. Um, this is a phenomenal part. I think if anybody's watching this part, they need to go back and, and watch part one because we talk about how prophecies, how Joseph Smith had the prophetic gift from God, and how that should fit into your testimony. It should be part of it, but your your testimony should be first, you know, faith in Jesus Christ, and then. A, a testimony, the rest, restoration in the church today in the Book of Mormon, those things. And then yeah. prophecies do fit in Joseph Smith. We can have a testimony of Joseph Smith's prophetic calling by looking in part at his prophetic gifts. And he certainly had them. And so what we're talking about here is one that occurred October 5th or 6th of 1833. And Joseph prophesied that the stars would fall from heaven within 40 days. And so Philo Dibble is out visiting this guy, and they call him Brother Hancock, and he's he's out visiting on day 39, and Hancock says, well, you're, you're Joseph Smith's not a prophet, he's a false prophet, and nothing's happened. Well, they kind of retire for, to bed, and I think it's 10, 11 o'clock at night, this meteor shower that the basically the Earth rarely sees starts happening. It's a four-hour meteor shower. And millions and millions of meteors, it was like one of the biggest in the history of the world. And they get Brother Hancock up and say, look what's happening. This is day 39. Wow. And it lights up the whole sky for, like I said, four hours. There was a scientific journal in the 1950s, I believe, that addressed this. And they went by and said, you know, this is just incredible. This, this is one of the largest meteor showers we've ever seen. Who would know? How yeah. Would Joseph- to predict the stars would fall from heaven within 40 days and have it on such a giant scale. Yeah, that, that was a prophecy that I found quite remarkable and quite miraculous because some you, you could say like, oh, well, yeah, he could have guessed that right. But that one, if, if it's recorded, you know, accurately, that's what really happened. There's no way he, he could have known that. That's, a, that's an unbelievable prophecy. That really is. So, um, I want to share with you. I have a friend that I do research with, and we've we've traveled quite a uh, traveled some. I've been in his home, uh, Craig Dunn down in Utah. He helped put together this slide. We had this prophecy. Let's move to Missouri. So we know a lot of things happened in Missouri, but one of them is after the Saints got their property stolen from them and got kicked out of Missouri or exterminated out of Missouri, and they went to Quincy. That Joseph and Hiram and a few others, including Alexander McRae. Um, they were in um, the Liberty Jail, right? Liberty Jail, yeah. So we also, most people who are familiar with some basic things of church history, you know about a guy named Alexander Donovan, who once refused 
to carry out an illegal order to shoot and kill Joseph Smith. And he became Joseph Smith's attorney. He was a uh, friend to the scenes, wasn't he? But I don't believe he ever joined. No, he didn't. So this is what's really cool. Donovan is visiting the jail at Liberty, and he's talking to some of the guys about a different client. And Donovan was allowed under guard uh, uh, to be there, and Joseph overheard a conversation that Joseph, that Donovan had been offered payment for some legal work he did, and the payment for somebody else, and the payment was a track of land in uh, in Jackson County in, in Independence. Joseph heard this and he said, quote, I advise you, he said to Donovan, I advise you not to take Jackson County land in payment of the debt. God's wrath hangs over Jackson County. God's people have been ruthlessly driven from it. And you will live to see the day when it will be visited by fire and sword. The Lord of hosts will sweep it with the bosom of destruction the fields and farms and houses will be destroyed, and only the chimneys will be left to mark the desolation. That's pretty powerful. Well, the Civil War is a fulfillment of that prophecy because the northern troops came, but there were some southern um, rebels called Quentrell's Raiders, and there was quite a battle, and Union soldiers swept down on Jackson, Cass, and Bates counties, killing animals, burning homes and fields, and molesting the inhabitants. Whole areas were plundered, left desolate by fire and sword, and some depopulated. The sufferings of the Missouri people have been thought by many writers to have exceeded the sufferings of the Mormons. In fact, wow. one soldier in 1864, Mr. Saxe, wrote, Quote, we found houses, barns, outbuildings, nearly all burned down, and nothing left standing but the chimneys. Wow. That matches now, Joseph Smith's prophecy. Exactly. Now, I want to share screens with you. Um, there was a non-Mormon painting done, a postcard done uh, in 1865 by a non-Mormon of... Check this out. I'm sorry, Brian. Just to, just to uh, double check, that was Donovan who recorded that one. What year was it he recorded it? The previous prophecy? No, that was. It's, it's actually in the history of the church. History of the church, okay. okay. But here's this postcard here. Check this out. The photograph shown here on the right were scan was scanned from a postcard of a mural painted in 1865 by Tom Lee, a non-Mormon. It affects the return of a Confederate family to their burned and barren farm in Jackson County after the Civil War. Note that only the chimney of the house is still standing. Wow. The, artist had, the artist had no idea he was painting the fulfillment of Joseph Smith's prophecy. Hmm. Wow, that, that's pretty amazing. No, no, a critic might say that. Well, when was this written in the history of the church, and was this written in, you know, after you know that had already happened? So then they're they're trying to fulfill prophecy. Um, well, we have it in the his comprehensive history of the church, volume one, uh, page five thirty eight. It's a source. I don't know when it was recorded, but Donovan. Um, lived to see that and he would have if this was attributed to him he would have uh you could have disputed it disputed it i mean i've got a book about donathan right over here on my bookshelf about his life and different essays if you go to I believe it's richmond missouri they have his statue outside the courthouse he was not only a, you know, an important figure in mormon history but in that area's history for decades and it, you know when this came out, if, if if something would have, if he would have said, "Well, I didn't ever say that, or I never heard this," or the people that were with Joseph, and remember there was witnesses, right, including right. Alexander McRae. Alexander McRae is actually my wife's fourth great grandfather. Oh no way! He, he penned as Joseph gave Doctrine and Covenants one twenty one, one twenty two, one twenty three. The, the writings in, in Joseph in, in Liberty Gentleman. Alexander uh, wrote it down. 
describe it. And so people would say, well, you know, that wasn't exactly the way it is. But we have non-Mormon sources such as this postcard and Mr. Saxe and things um, that, uh, that uh, said that there was only chimneys left. Now, this wasn't the only prophecy about Missouri. Um, Joseph gave lots of prophecies <laughs> about Missouri, okay? And the, the fact that, that God's hand would be upon those people for stealing and murdering and plundering and raping, killing Mormons, think of Hans Mill, okay? Mm -hmm. The Lord of hosts will sweep it with the bosom of destruction. I, I don't think that, that we can dispute that. Uh, that Joseph, in fact, now we, we can do a deep dive into even the conversation Joseph had with President Van Buren about the, the, the atrocities the saints uh, suffered in Missouri and, and, and the redress that we, we saw. Uh, but let's move on. I, I really feel like that, that this is one of Joseph's most powerful prophecies. But I'll yeah. tell you one that uh, the, that really um, was was more contemporary. Um, we know about the story of Governor Boggs, Lebrun Boggs. He was sitting in his house in a in an easy chair type situation, a lazy boy type situation, and somebody shot at him. Yeah, there's right? the attempted murder or assassination yeah. on him. Right, and the fingers pointed to who? The church Porter Rockwell. Right. We know about Porter Rockwell, Joseph Smith's bodyguard. Bodyguard. Porter. Yeah. Was Had long Porter hair. Rockwell's? Yeah. Well, not and that was it. another another prophecy of Joseph Smith. It's in the book, but we're not going to talk about it today. Porter Rockwell was kind of quipped one time. He said, Well, you you know it's not me because if, if I would have taken that shot, Boggs would have been dead. I would have hit him. <laughs> I'm I'm that good of a shot. You know, whoever shot at Boggs missed, it wasn't me. <laughs> um, but so the saints had been kicked out, and the Missourians still just loathed uh, the Mormons, even after they kicked us out of Missouri. Okay, And uh, when Boggs got shot, they pointed the finger at Porter Rockwell. So this is what happened on March, uh, March 4th, 1843. Porter Rockwell was down in St. Louis, Missouri, and he was arrested and put in iron hobbles, which are like uh, handcuffs, and taken to Independence, Missouri for trial. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think it's going to be a friendly jury? Definitely not. <laughs> so, 11 days later, when Joseph learned that Rockwell was in Independence, there for a trial for the murder, or for the attempted assassination of Governor Lilburn Boggs, uh, Lilburn Boggs, Joseph... Uh, prophesies he quotes and this is history of the church volume five and so this 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 was written before he died in 1844 so it's very contemporary he says i prophesied in the name of jesus the lord jesus christ that orm porter rockwell will get away honorably from the missourians really joseph it seems, seems unlikely and <laughs> Extremely <laughs> unlikely. Yeah. But he prophesied in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that Orm Porter Rockwell will get away honorably from the Missourians. And they had it. They had him where they wanted him in independence with the jury that they wanted, with the charges they wanted. Well, guess what? Rockwell was tried December 13th, 1843, and the charge of shooting former Governor Boggs could not be sustained, and he was released according to the prophecy of Jesus. Wow. Extremely unlikely, uh, and and especially since the Missourians had a lot of animosity towards the Mormons, they would have been motivated to to want to you know press you know charges him be guilty of it, but um, obviously he wasn't. So let's move on to some Nauvoo era things. Um, a lot of people don't realize they they've heard of the Lincoln Abraham Lincoln Stephen Douglas debates really famous, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. In fact, in, in high school debate clubs, they still have the Lincoln-Douglas format. So Stephen Douglas was in, uh, was in Illinois. Of course, Lincoln is from Illinois. And um, they were sitting around in 1843. This is uh, 
May 18th, 1843, Joseph and uh, was it Orn, excuse me, um, Orson Hyde, Joseph Smith, Orson Hyde, they were at the home of the sheriff of Hancock County. His name was uh, Jacob Backentos. And having dinner with Sheriff Backentos, Joseph and Orson Hyde, Joseph Smith and Orson Hyde was Stephen Douglas. And he was kind of friends, Stephen Douglas was. And some people are familiar with his prophecy. Uh, Joseph Smith told Stephen Douglas at that dinner in 1843, this is uh, May 18th, 1843, and it's well recorded that this was said at that time to Stephen. He says, quote, you will yet aspire to the presidency of the United States. But if you ever raise your hand or your voice against the Latter-day Saints, you shall never be president of the United States, unquote. Okay. Well, here's what happened. The Saints moved west. They had their territory, had a territorial charter. And in June 1857, Douglas was starting to think about running for president. He called the Mormons a disgusting cancer and called for the repeal of the territorial status of Utah. He also called the Mormons a loathsome ulcer on the body politic. Wow, you really turned against them? Really big time. Well, Douglas's popularity increased and in the 1860 election, he was a shoo-in for the presidency. He was the leader of the dominant party. His political party in the election before had gotten more votes than the two rival com uh, parties combined. Everybody just, it was just a given that Stephen Douglas was going to be the next president of the United States, even going into the election. But according to Joseph Smith's prophecy, it was a miraculous defeat. Douglas only won two states and got 12 electrical, uh, electoral votes, and Lincoln got 180. This unknown oh. Lincoln guy, it was 180 to 12. Lincoln had earlier we said, leave the, the Mormons. Lincoln earlier had said, leave the Mormons alone. Lincoln won. Douglas, who everybody in the country, all the newspapers said he was a shoe in he got 12. Electro votes and Lincoln got 180. Unbelievable. Oh, as soon as cool. that election in 1860, November 27th, Orson Hyde wrote to Douglas. He says, Don't you remember Joseph telling you this? Oh. <laughs> Douglas died a year later, 18, in 1861, at age 48, a disappointed man. And we have that in the book. Uh, this, all the details of, of page on um, page 116. Isn't that interesting? In 1843, Joseph said, you will yet aspire to the presidency of the United States, but if you ever raise your hand or your voice against Latter-day Saints, you shall never be president of the United States. And he was an absolute shoo-in, and he totally landslide against him. Oh. He died the next year. You tell me if that's not a prophetic gift. Uh, uh, it's very specific as well. Very specific. So one of one of one of the coolest things, and again, my his, my my specialty is the is Hancock County, which has Nauvoo and Carthage and Warsaw, right? Uh, during the Mormon period, I've done ten years of research now. Well, a lot of people, and you can really kind of get into the trial and things when Joseph went to Carthage, and there's several really good books out there. Um, about the lead up, uh, Alan Oaks and Marv Hill put together a book years ago called The Carthage Conspiracy. That's kind of the gold standard. There's some other books out there, mm -hmm. um, including by my friend Craig Dunn called The Martyrdom Trail. Plug, plug that just a little bit. But as Joseph went to uh, Carthage, this is two, a day or two, be two days before his martyrdom, um, you know, they were having some court hearings and they tried to do this and, or they, they charged him with, uh, you know, one thing and that didn't stick with riot and so they charged them with with um um let's see I, I i don't want to get too far in the details they basically were were trying to decide on what to what they needed to charge him with to keep him there without bail and so they eventually charged him with treason okay essentially um because he can post bail for that but 
Joseph hadn't been charged or convicted yet. He was charged but not convicted because that's why at the Carthage jail, he was in the bedroom, not the jail cell, right? Right. Um, they, they put him there for safekeeping, but a day or two before, actually two days before, June 25th, 1844, Joseph is, uh, had visited the governor. They were staying at this hotel called the Hamilton House. Okay. And um, what happened was that Joseph was talking to some of the mob members, the, the militia members that were there. And it is about lunchtime. And he looks at him and says, Am I, do I look like the kind of guy that you have heard about? And they said, no, you don't look threatening at all. You know, along those lines. And Joseph says, um, you know, you can't see what's in my heart, but quote, but I can see what's in your heart. And I will tell you what I see. This is Joseph talking to the mob. Your thirst for blood and nothing but my, you, you thirst for blood and nothing but my blood will satisfy you. I prophesy in the name of the Lord that you shall witness scenes of blood to your entire satisfaction. And many of you who are now present shall face the cannon's mouth from sources you think not of. But you did that before. Perfect. Sorry, Brian, you just right. uh, broke up there for a wee second. Okay. I, I don't know if you've heard that. Let me repeat this. June 25th, Joseph's talking to the mob and, and says, your thirst for blood, nothing but my blood will satisfy you. Quote, I prophesy in the name of the Lord that you shall witness scenes of blood to your entire satisfaction, and many of you who are now present shall face the cannon's mouth from sources you think not of. Have you heard that one before? Mm -mm, no. Okay. Well, here's what happened. Joseph was murdered two days later, not upstairs, but down by the well, right? As we talked about in part one. Mm -hmm. Um Many of these soldiers that were there that day that heard Joseph's prophecies were called to, I think this was about roughly 10 years later. Um, I've got it in the book on page 149. Um, they were called to fight uh, the Mex Mexican War with uh, Santa Ana. And there was a battle called the Battle of Buena Vista. And these people from Carthage were in this battle Many of them were in this battle at Buena Vista, and they got caught in friendly fire and killed. And so when Joseph says, you shall face the cannon's mouth from sources you think not of, it was friendly fire cannons shooting at them and killing them. Wow. Prophecy fulfilled June 25th, 1844, at noon at the Hamilton House in Carthage, Illinois. Now, the Car Hamilton House no longer stands, but it's about three blocks from Center Square, and there's a plaque there. And last week, me and my wife were there at that plaque, and this happened with this prophecy now. You wow. can't make stuff up. Joseph Smith had a tremendous prophetic gift, and left and right, he was telling people, now, you might remember this one. On June 27th, he had prophesied to Willard Richards, who was in the room when the mob came up the stairs. He said, to Willard Richards, the time will come that the that balls would fly around him. Yeah. Okay, you've heard this one, right? The time Man, he was a big guy, balls, from my understanding. Yes, he was about twice as big as Joseph Brown, if heavy yet. Hmm. Uh, the balls would fly around him like hell, and he should see his friends fall on the right and on the left, but that there should not be a hole in his garment. Who would have thought a, a, a bullet grazed his ear, but not a hole in his garment? And that's a that's a verified. That's June 27th, 1844 at 5 16 p.m. That 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 prophecy got fulfilled. Um, can I share two that's more with cool you? One. Oh yeah, yeah. So when people say Joseph Smith had no people have time, oh, he's got all these, he's a failed prophet. He didn't, you know, some somebody even said he didn't have a single prophecy fulfilled an evangelical anti-mormon guy said that i'm like are you kidding you just don't know what you're talking about so probably what my favorite and i share this quite a bit was the prophecy of dan jones okay yes yeah that's a good one okay well here's here's what happened 
Dan Jones was from Wales, not far from you. <laughs> yeah. And he, he was a riverboat captain. And he came to the United States in the 1840s and was in the St. Louis area. And he, I, we, I'll give you a little more background than I normally give, um, because I became familiar with Dan Jones in my work uh, researching the history of Warsaw. And there was a newspaper editor there named Thomas Sharp in Warsaw that would write terrible things about the church that Thomas Sharp was one of the five that stood trial for the, um, for the crime at Carthage. And uh, so Dan Jones is running this riverboat in, and they called him Captain Dan Jones because of his profession. He's running this riverboat in uh, St. Louis. And he started, and this is the early 1840s, he starts hearing these reports of these Mormons up the river in Nauvoo. And he says, to basically, in so many words that, yeah, what I'm reading about, written by Thomas Sharp and others, and republished in local newspapers from the Warsaw Signal newspaper that Thomas Sharp edited and ran, says, this possibly can't be true. I'm curious of, of what's going on here. And then the Mormon missionaries came, and he believed learned, believed, and he was baptized in a frozen Mississippi river. And then the next spring, he goes up to Nauvoo and meets Joseph Smith, and they become fast friends. Okay. Um, gosh, there's a lot of directions we can go here. He later recollects, Dan Jones says, I'd like to thank this Thomas Sharp and others for turning our attention to the saints by because by by his writings, essentially, I, we learned about Joseph Smith and became converted. So that it's kind of like this anti-Mormon thing backfired and got Dan Jones into the church. But Dan Jones, um, uh, and became, you see some of that today with some, uh, you know, people who join this church. I've seen some scenes in scripted stories that's actually been looking at uh, some anti-Mormon stuff has actually led them into the church to be converted. That certainly happened with Dan Jones and Dan Jones. Uh, this is an incredibly and remarkable, per, incredible and remarkable person in church history. He had received a, a mission call to go to Wales, okay? Uh, and he was with Joseph and Hiram and Willard and John Taylor and a couple others uh, in Carthage Jail. And he was there the night before the martyrdom. This would be June 6, 1844. Okay. So. There, it, it becomes nightfall, and there's shots being heard over at the square about a block and a half, two blocks away, and there's different things happening. There's people wrestling outside, and they retire to bed, maybe 11, maybe midnight, and they're laying on the floor, and uh, Dan Jones starts talking to Joseph about dying. Are you prepared to die? And they talk a little bit about it. And Joseph looks at Dan and basically says, you're not going to die. He says, quote, ye shall yet see Wales and fulfill the mission appointed unto you. Okay, not that big of a deal. It's just Joseph Smith's last prophecy. The person the next morning kind of prophesies what's going to happen to the church, but this is his last prophecy of person. Well, Dan Jones, they get up the next morning, and Dan Jones is set on, set on, sent on assignment by Joseph to run some errands. Uh, one of the things was that he was uh, given some papers to take to Joseph's attorney down in Quincy. So Dan Jones is outside the Carthage jail with some papers. Well, there's a mob members and militia people out and see these papers and Dan Jones holding them. They think that Dan Jones has papers from Joseph to take to Nauvoo to reassemble the Nauvoo Legion that had been disassembled and maybe come and get Joseph. And they didn't want that to happen. So several people fire their guns at Dan Jones outside the Carthage jail. They miss him. His life is miraculously spared. But in the confusion, it turns Dan and his horse around and they start marching off on the wrong road. They didn't, they were supposed to go to Quincy, but they were so confused they went on the wrong road to Quincy. And that second, that was a second miracle because the first miracle is he wasn't killed at Carthage by the mob. There was a mob, there's, uh, we call them mob, there was um, a, re a regiment of soldiers and things on the right road to Quincy with orders to kill any Mormons that came that way a couple miles out of town. If Dan Jones had not been turned around, he would have been killed on that road, but he, he went down the wrong road and saved his life. Later, <laughs> so that's two. 
later that day, he was on a, he made it to the river north of Warsaw. He got on a boat, went south to Warsaw, down to Quincy to deliver these papers to Joseph's attorney. The boat was stopped in Warsaw. It was searched by people in Warsaw. Miraculously, they did not see him on the boat, even though he was there in plain sight. Well, in plain sight, he was probably at the covers, but they, they did not find him on the boat. Okay, Three times that day, Joseph Smith's prophecy to Dan Jones was fulfilled. His life was spared, and not only did he go to one mission to Wales, he went to on two missions to Wales. He became one of the most important and powerful missionaries for the early church. He would preach for eight to 10 hours in the public squares in different towns in, in, in Wales. Through his preaching, thousands of people became members of the church. He published tracts in Welsh, the first, uh, some of the first gospel tracts in non-English. Um, one person he converted or that listened to him and believed uh, joined the church became the first missionary to France. Um, Dan Jones, his pa pa painting of Dan Jones preaching in Wales is in Preach My Gospel. If you open up the first lesson, the first lesson, yep. first page picture. is Dan Wells preaching. If you go to the Provo MTC, that same painting is on the wall as you walk into the MTC. All because Thomas Sharp wrote negatively about the prophet Joseph Smith and the Mormons and fulfilling Joseph Smith's last prophecy that Dan Jones will yet see Wales, even though he was should have been killed three times that first day of the martyrdom, the, the day of the martyrdom, the first day after this was given. Okay. Dan Jones was bringing back a group of saints from Wales into the Salt Lake Valley. It was announced that they were looking for, they were having a general conference of the church. They needed a choir. Some of the Welch converts sang. They organized a choir for a general conference. And that choir became what we know today as the Mormon Tabernacle Choir or the choir now, we call it the choir at Temple Square. Wow. All because Dan Jones did yet see Wales according to the prophecy of Joseph Smith. So many things that came from it. Okay. That's really that's really cool. Now, can I share one last thing with you? Yes. Um, well, I was gonna ask, um, it wasn't there prophecies about the saints going to the Rocky Mountains as well? Oh, Dozens of them. Well, a lot of them. Let's put it that way. A lot of them. We have some in the book um, uh, in here. And there's there's a secondary and, and third-hand accounts. We have primary accounts as well um, early on. And, and that was so important. I mean, I really became familiar with that subject. Again, when with my history of Warsaw, Illinois, Robert, well, there was, there was several people uh, – Let's not get it too far off in a tangent, but there were people in the area that were commissioned by the government to go and survey. Um, you know, John Bridger and, and others surveyed the, the Salt Lake Basin, and they came back to the Nauvoo era, uh, area and the Hancock area, Hancock County area with their maps. And so when Brigham Young started plotting out exactly where they were going to go, they, they knew. They knew where they were going to go thanks to this work from some of these uh, explorers that were in Hancock County. But Joseph specifically said that saints will settle in the, the Salt Lake Valley. Yeah. So let me, let me just talk just one last thing here. After Joseph died, you know what the sentiment in the United States was? Uh, New York uh, newspaper wrote... That just the, you know, this is going to die Mormonism. Right yeah, that's in Mormonism, and that was a general sentiment. Okay, it was a, a flash in the pan. Well, I'm not sure if if you can necessarily call this a prophecy, but it is definitely a pretty cool prediction because around Joseph's name carried the, the spirit of prophecy even among non-Mormons. So here is two newspaper accounts: the large-scale sentiment. Uh, 
large scale scale sentiment in the United States was quote Joseph Smith the Mormon prophet is dead thus ends Mormonism. This was in uh, I believe July of 1844 in the New York Weekly Herald famous quote. Mm-hmm. Well, a competing newspaper, Salt Lake, or the New York Tribune, July 20th, 1844, they wrote, and here is a picture of the article from the original newspaper, and my friend Craig Dunn sent me this, uh, says, Joseph Smith has carved out for himself a title to a page in the history of his country. And his name will be remembered for good or for evil, where the names of half the statesmen of the age will be forgotten. I want you to notice this, these words here. Joseph Smith carved in, in, out for himself, quote, a title to a page in the history of his country. People thought that was nuts. Mormonism's dead. Well, in 2015, at the magazine from the Smithsonian in, in Washington, D.C., published a special edition of the 130 most influential, 130 of the most influential Americans. And guess who has a page in the history of his country? There it is. Number one religious figure, Joseph Smith Jr., with a whole page of his painting. Off to the right there. It's his, his picture painted off to the right there. Mm-hmm. Joseph Smith is a top. The Smithsonian's Magazine of Top Religious Figures in 2015. Thus, making this statement true, that he carved out for himself a title to a page in the history of his country. How remarkable is that? That's really cool. Well, Brian, I think this has been a really good sort of like discussion and sort of like a good overview of some of the the prophecies of Joseph Smith. I think it's important for people to be aware of some of the fulfilled prophecies of Joseph Smith, and that might strengthen you know people's you know faith in Joseph Smith as a prophet and in the restoration. Again, not being the the foundation, but um, these sorts of things can be helpful, and also uh, to understand these in light of balancing out when people are just seeing the supposed failed prophecies that critics would point to but it's also looking at look at all of these fulfilled ones as well and i want to ask you like in, in closing like what would you say because i've heard critics say that like well even if there were some uh fulfilled prophecies if there's one failed prophecy then he's a false prophet according to what it says in in deuteronomy what, what would you say to that? we address that in in the book um, you, you got to really take a look at these so-called failed prophecies. Um, you know, what are the details? Are they, if this will happen, if this will happen, if this other thing happens most of the time, um, will Jackson County be the site of the new Jerusalem in this generation? Absolutely. Just don't tell me what this generation is 50 years or hundred years, because that's not the way the savior used that term. Mm. Um, I, I, I have not found a credible failed prophecy that does not have some sort of reasonable exp- explanation. Um, they, they, they're just, they're, that makes it not a failed prophecy. There's no failed prophecies. In Joseph Smith. There's some that have not come to pass and some that were conditional. Um, I'd, I'd really like to somebody to, to send me, uh, a failed prophecy and I'll find an answer because there's an explanation and answer out there. Believe me, the scholars in the gospel have spent religion professors and people who work for the church, they they there's answers for everything out there. You know, the the church hasn't really turned a blind eye. The information is there. We just get so busy. You know, Mormons have larger families and we're raising our family and we're looking to you know, receive covenants and gather Israel and do the important things of the gospel, right? And we sometimes kind of get lost 
and, and don't have time. We're trying to keep up with Come Follow Me, and we're trying to do all these things that we're we're supposed to do in temple worship and work. And, and then there's all these podcasts as well out there that take up so much you time. Like, who is the time to read a book about Drew Smith's Fulfill Prophecy? But it, it's, a, I think, an important book for because most members, I would say, would probably not be aware of a lot of these things. No, they, well. they're not. They're not. We're so caught up in living the gospel and and then doing the missions of the church that sometimes we just forget. But we have to know, and our young people have to know that we are built upon the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ by Jesus Christ and God the Father, including this the fulfilling of the, the Old Testament, New Testament prophets that there'll be a gathering in the last days. The priests and keys have been restored. The church organization has been restored. Each scripture has been restored. And the prophetic gifts were given to Joseph Smith. And if we were really to get into it, Russell Nelson has major prophetic gifts. And it's we don't we're not privy to all the things that are happening, but on a large scale, when he told us to get ready for home church and then the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. that is as good as anything Joseph Smith did. We, in our lifetime, saw the prophetic gift of Russell Nelson teaching the church to get ready to have church at home and have a home-based gospel study. And I also think a little bit with ministering as well, replacing home teaching, that not necessarily always having to go and do monthly visits because during COVID as well, you couldn't go around and visit people. There's different ways that you could... Uh, contact and people and care for them and help them. But guess what? The Christ would say, oh, he just got lucky. How many times does church leaders have to get lucky before somebody says, okay, maybe there's something here? Over and over and over and over and over, they hit the bullseye mm -hmm. prophetically. And I think these, you know, the fulfilled prophecies of Joe Smith, they, they really do need to be taken into account as well by, you know, maybe unbelievers or critics as they're you know evaluating joseph smith and if he was a prophet or not and i think it's something that is not discussed enough whenever i was first in my faith crisis and stepped away from church and lost my faith i, I wasn't aware of these fulfilled prophecies of joseph smith and whenever i started encountering some faithful evidences to support i was trying to like how do i make sense of that like how would he get these things right if you were you know a con man or a false prophet and i think yeah it's it's really interesting and when the truth gets out there, gets out in the light, it really becomes faith strengthening, faith promoting. Uh, and thank you, for Steve. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian, for coming on for this discussion. And listeners, if you've watched this, give this video a thumbs up. Go check out Brian's book. I'll put the link in the description and like, share, and subscribe to my channel, Ornus with the Murph, uh, so you don't miss out on any future content. And I'll see you all very soon. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor Spotify, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Check out my website for more content, personal blog, and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can buy my PayPal or Patreon, or through the website. And you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mornism with the Murph. Take care. Bye-bye.